had made this very hardcore punk movie called Debidio, dealing with the LA underground punk scene. It starred Joan Jett and Ray Sharkey. I spent the maniacal year of my life in the editing room. This was pre-avid, cutting this thing, you know, it was just completely insane. But I had a lot of fun doing it. And the LA Weekly, a writer there, a great writer, Gloria Olin, did like a, a profile on me that I had, because I created Welcome Back Carter. Half the page in the LA Weekly that week was devoted to me. The other half of the page was devoted to a group of skateboarders, girls. They were 15 years old. They were called the Hags. And I said to myself, what the hell is this? Who, first of all, they're taking up space where I should have been, had more story, but more importantly, who were they? What was this cultural thing that was going on? And so I began researching it, and I realized that there was a skateboarding world, and I knew that it would make a good movie. I started going around connecting with the various skateboarders to get involved in the scene. Tony Alva, Steve Olson, and these were the hardcore skaters, and I figured if I got through with the hardcore guys, then I would be accepted by the rest of the guys. And I discovered this skateboarding scene, and then I figured, well, let me create a story about these people, you know, what they're doing. So I took the concept of Romeo and Juliet and laid it out in, in the skateboarding world. The Daggers were the bad boys in Venice or Dogtown, and the ramp locals were, you know, the wimps from the valley. And a girl who's the sister of the leader of the Daggers falls for a wimp from the valley. And I shot pictures of the skateboarders and put it into like an oak tag presentation. Very, you know, scribbled out, hardcore, before PowerPoint presentations with this story. I went out and bought a skateboard and then I went out and started pitching the show. And people didn't know what I was talking about. I came in, I went into the pitch meetings with a skateboard under my arm, told them about the culture, told them about the, the dialogue, the, the language that the kids had. And then there was Freeze, Charles Freeze Entertainment, who was the executive producer on the movie. He looked at me like I, and I've done several things with Chuck, he looked at me like I was completely crazy, but he went home and he spoke to his, at that time, you know, 13-year-old son. And he called me the next day and he said, my son says this is the biggest thing that's happening right now. And so then he gave me the money to do the script and I, I got a young guy to work with, Paul Brown, and we collaborated on the script. It was my first paid writing assignment. So I was on board, I wanted just to experience the adventure, but I didn't really realize how big skateboarding was about to become. But yeah, what was interesting is there, it almost, there were two worlds. There were like the good boys and then there were the bad boys of skating. You know, and then the good boys had their hats on, and everything matched. And then there was this rebel group over here that had no helmet, ragtag clothes. And so that was interesting to watch the different worlds that, that coexisted in the skate park. And so we took that experience and applied it to the script. We put together a five minute video presentation of skateboarding, of killer skateboarding footage. And with Freeze, I went to the Cannes Film Festival where we pre tested the thing. And at Cannes, we had French skaters, and we made like a big hullabaloo, and Freeze realized that he would be able to get the financing in the foreign markets because there was an interest out there, and so then he greenlit the picture. I had brought in David Winters to direct the thing. And the reason that I had brought in David is he was a dancer in West Side Story, and again, Romeo and Juliet, West Side Story, thrashing. So he was a dancer in West Side Story. He was a choreographer, and he also had directed a lot of low-budget films. And so he knew the technique, and I figured that skateboarding was very much in um, the tradition of dancing. If you can shoot dancing, skateboarding is the way to go. So that's why I thought that David would be the perfect match. The first day of shooting, we had all the daggers dressed up, and the director yelled, action. And then suddenly he heard all these skateboards coming around a corner. And they hit the corner and they're all looking great in their leather jackets and they all hit water and they all fell down. There must have been a hundred people watching that all died laughing. And we had to go back and start all over again. So that was a, clearly a lot, of, a lot of posers, guys that looked great in leather jackets that could not skate. We wanted actors who could skate. So primarily first you gotta act, but like Robert Rustler, I mean, he's a good skater, and he became a skater. He's still hanging with the skaters. Check it out, hooking the dagger. 
I played Little Stevie. He was a member, the youngest member of the Ramp Locals, the good guys. When I came into the audition for Thrash and I had no idea how to skateboard. My mom bought me a skateboard at like the local Target the night before the audition. I practiced all night in my driveway and I was lucky enough that I had enough, you know, natural coordination to do it. And after that I loved skateboarding, but before I really didn't know anything about skateboarding and now uh, I was lucky enough to stay on the board and not kill myself and get the part. In certain instances, we needed doubles for all of our actors. So we had wigs for Josh Richmond and Josh um, Brolin. We had scenes then they were skating Hollywood Boulevard. But we also, for the stunts, you know, for the, for the radical moves, we had skaters with wigs on. Stacy kind of, Stacy Peralta, who's the premier, you know, skate director, organized that whole thing, you know. And, he had, we had the wigs in the same wardrobe and we did some, you know, it's, you know, you don't want to lay on the floor and have some guy come over and do an ollie over you. I don't want to do that. I mean, that, that takes, you know, you want somebody that can really do this thing. You know, so we had Lance Mountain and Mike McGill and these were the, Stephen Caballero, these were like the premier skaters of the time. Every skater that was happening then was in the film. Tony Hawk's in this movie. He was 13 or 14 years old, and we went down, we shot several scenes down in Del Mar, and Tony was a young skateboarder, and we used him in the film. Yeah, I remember going down there and watching those kids, ba ba Tony Hawk literally flying through the air and watching the, the insanity of all that. So that was a, that for me, that was a whole new world. We had Johnny Ray, who's a singer in The Knitters. Um, he, was, he was one of the daggers, and Jesse Martinez, and Tony Alva, a lot of Alva's crew. I was the adult supervision for out-of-control skateboarders, and I had more fun doing this than almost anything I've ever done. This was a complete ball. You'll see the scene where we're in Venice and everything is graffitied and, you know, the guys are dressed radically and, you know, they're wearing like almost Hells Angels colors as skateboarders. That was all my doing, and I just had a ball giving it, you know, that color and that flavor. The production, we did it during the summer, and as Paul Brown said to me, he said, man, we are going to have a fantastic summer. We're going to be skating this summer. So we kind of lived the movie as we, as we were producing it. We shot up in Bronson Canyon. We created the scene where there's the joust. We were up there all night long, you know. We set up fires. I and mean, the whole movie wasn't, it wasn't a big-budget film, but we just had a great time doing it. The downhill didn't exist. That was fiction. Now they're doing it. Okay, so a lot of the uh, fiction has become reality. Well, you better be good at home. We cast the Chili Peppers to be the skate band in the movie. And that was when they had their original lineup. It was an unbelievable day. We rented a club in Hollywood. We had 200 extras. And these guys, Flea and Anthony, they sang for hours. We had hours of footage. And it was great. And you see their performance in the movie. We then tested the movie. And we, I say the, the production, the studio, which was Freeze at the time, took, this, took the movie to um, audience studies where they test movies, like a focus group, asking the audience what they thought of the movie. And, you know, when, when in a focus group, you kind of get, you get 300 people sitting and twisting dials from very good to very dull. And this movie took off. I mean, it started, the skating, the chart went up, it was doing well. And we get to the scene where the peppers are happening at the skate concert, and it goes from up there it takes a nosedive. Now, I don't know who this audience was, but they just couldn't see the peppers in it at all. And I looked around, and this was one of my favorite parts in the scene, because they were one of my favorite bands in the world and still are. And, um, and Freeze and it looks at me, and it, today he laughs about this too. He said, you got to get them out of the movie. No punk in this movie at all. We got to take it out. And I pleaded, I just pleaded with him, Chuck, you gotta, let, you gotta let us keep the Chili Peppers in this movie. And he always laughs about that now when he sees me. Sax, you were right, you know, we kept the peppers in. You know, Webster, I always like to meet the new skaters. You uh, did Del Mar, didn't you? Yeah, I did that one. Yeah. You know, a couple more meets like that, you'll be skating smash skates. Today, the skateboarders, they're styling. These guys are making some big bank just because they're good skateboarders. Then there were companies, I think there was Vision, Powell, Peralta, they were sponsoring people. 
Stacy was sponsoring people. We used the Powell Peralta team as skate doubles in the movie, you know. Um, and so that was the the goal is to get sponsorship, and that was happening. But in a way, we were kind of prophetic on how big this has become because this is this is really motivational today for the kids. To me, the movie was sort of ahead of its time. I mean, look at all the stuff that's going on with skateboarding, the X Games, and everything. And people were in the movie, like the the Red Hot Chili Peppers were in the movie, and I, I tell that to people, and they're like, they go crazy. I mean, I still I see people on the street, and when they when they talk about when we get into thrashing, they find out that I actually was in the movie. They are like, un they're unbelievable. They they came like, dude, thrashing was awesome, man. One after the movie came out, even years later, that I remember everyone knew about the movie. There was another time I, I went to the Cannes Film Festival and I remember talking to some people and there was a girl that was from Norway and her father owned all these video stores through Scandinavia. And she said that was the top selling movie. Joust. Yeah. Right. <laughs> be there. No, you be there. You shut up, you little punk. <laughs> Guys my age, they see it and they like, you know, sort of like a cult classic for them. So it's, uh, I'm very proud to be a part of, uh, of the world of thrashing. I want kids out there to look at this movie and look at the moves and say, wow, man, look how he nailed that ramp. Look how he pulled air. And I want them to be able to do that. I look at it as like a, a piece of pop culture. And that's what I want people to come away with. And I want the kids who are out there skating to say, wow, man, dig that. I want my 11-year-old kid who's a skater now to really be, you know, digging the fact that I made this movie.